A disturbing trend that I see in today's society shrouds my musings like a dark fog. It is a drive towards self-destruction, something I cannot ignore. My words against the idea of asceticism become a shadow compared to a new anxiety, ominous and unshakable. People, as if captive to their vices and passions, withdraw into the abysses of alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, losing themselves in this darkness. They seem to give up control over themselves, as if captive to their own demons. What does this loss of willpower stem from? Perhaps the modern world, with its fast pace and uncertainty, pressures those who do not find the strength to stand against the wind. Or perhaps it is the result of the loss of higher values and ideals? When faith in the higher purpose and meaning of being goes away, a person loses his bearings in this world. Strong in spirit, I must resist these trials, harden myself against them. Not to seek oblivion in dope and inactivity, but to find myself in creativity, love, knowledge of the world. Overcome the weaknesses of the flesh with the power of will and spirit. Do not be like a herd, wandering to the slaughter. Be free and powerful, and then, perhaps, life will unfold in its fullness. In the history of human thought, we can find many examples of preaching self-destructive ideas. The most striking example is the philosophy of nihilism, which became widespread in the 19th century. Its founder is considered to be Friedrich Nietzsche, who put forward the idea of revaluation of all values. In the work The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music, the young Nietzsche sees the origins of nihilism in the rationalism of Socrates, who rejected the mystical and irrational in favor of logic and reason. This led to the degradation of ancient Greek culture, which lost touch with the Dionysian beginning. Later, Nietzsche analyzes Christianity as a religion based on the rejection of the world and life in favor of illusory values. From his point of view, Christian morality leads to the weakening and degeneration of man. It denies strong passions, instincts, the will to power, extolling humility and forgiveness. Nietzsche considered the ideas of Enlightenment humanism and liberalism of the 19th century to be the pinnacle of nihilism. The rejection of religious values led to a spiritual crisis. God died, and with him died all Christian virtues. Thus, Nietzsche saw in nihilism the logical conclusion of the process of destruction of higher values and meanings, which began in antiquity and continues in his modern era. In his opinion, it can be overcome only through a reassessment of values and the emergence of a superhuman capable of putting his own will at the center of things. However, nihilism itself does not call for physical self-destruction. More radical ideas in this direction were put forward by another German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, in his work The World as Will and Representation. The key factor that prompted Arthur Schopenhauer to write his seminal philosophical work was a critique of the dominant rationalist and positivist views of the world and cognition of his time. Schopenhauer believed that the essence of being can be understood not only with the help of reason and logic, but also by turning to other ways of comprehending reality. The ideas of Eastern teachings, primarily Buddhism, with their emphasis on the illusory nature of the world and pessimistic perception of life as suffering, had a great influence on the formation of his views. Schopenhauer also relied on the achievements of natural science of his time, seeing the manifestations of the primordial will in the behavior and instincts of living beings. As a result, the purpose of his work was to present a fundamentally new view of the world, divided into will as a thing in itself and representation as a way of giving will to consciousness. Schopenhauer's ideas had a profound influence on later pessimistic thinkers, such as Eduard von Hartmann. In his work, Philosophy of the Unconscious, he developed the doctrine that existence is the greatest of evils, and that non-existence is the only true goal. Thus, the idea of self-destruction as the supreme goal is found in the history of philosophy, but only in isolated cases leads to the formation of radical destructive cults. A nihilist is a man who bows to no authority, who takes no principle on faith, however much respect may surround that principle. Ivan Turgenev Many people, to one degree or another, take pleasure in the process of destruction. Psychologists explain this by releasing accumulated energy, relieving tension and stress. Physiologically, this is accompanied by the release of joy hormones, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin. From an evolutionary point of view, the urge to destroy may have been formed as a survival instinct. 
In order to hunt and defend themselves, humans needed to develop the capacity for aggression and violence. By destroying and killing prey, the caveman gained food and experienced a sense of triumph. In addition, the capacity for violence helped to defend the hierarchy in the tribe, conquer new territories, and seize resources. By activating these archaic mechanisms, modern man can also feel the satisfaction of destruction. However, along with this, there are also opposite qualities in human nature. Empathy, striving for harmony, creation. Therefore, for most people, destruction cannot be a goal. It is only a way to diffuse aggression. It is creative activity that brings true satisfaction. The urge to destroy is rooted in our nature, but reason allows us to control and sublimate it. In every man there is a beast that needs blood. Friedrich Nietzsche According to Aristotle, tragedy through compassion and fear purifies the viewer of such emotions and experiences. Watching the hero, a person as if lives tragic events together with him, which allows him to free himself from the excess of such feelings in real life. Aristotle associated this with the medical effect of catharsis, purification of the body. Tragedy acts on the soul in the same way as medical means act on the body, getting rid of harmful substances. It is important that it is the socially dangerous affects, fear and aggression, that are purified. Their excess destabilizes the individual and society. Catharsis restores mental balance. This is how Aristotle first conceptualized the psychotherapeutic and social function of art. Many thinkers later developed this idea in relation to real life. For example, Sigmund Freud in his work, Dissatisfaction with Culture, argued that art allows us to sublimate displaced instincts without destroying culture. I have devoted my whole life to the study of the human psyche, its conscious and unconscious processes. But recent events have forced me to take a completely new look at the relationship between the individual and society. When the First World War broke out, I was shocked by the irrationality of the crowd, the barbarity and cruelty between nations. I believed in the values of humanism and progress, but I saw how fragile the gloss of civilization was. My discussions with Einstein only reinforced my doubts. He believed that war could be avoided by the intelligent organization of society. But I realized that it wasn't just external conditions, but human nature itself. I came to believe that culture constantly restrains powerful irrational impulses hidden in the unconscious. This gives rise to a fundamental contradiction that cannot be completely overcome. Indeed, catharsis provides an outlet for latent emotions without resulting in actual destruction. Thus, violent video games can distract potential criminals from real-life violence. At the same time, there is another point of view. For example, Eric Fromm in his book Anatomy of Human Destructiveness argued that any manifestation of aggression only intensifies it. In his opinion, catharsis is an illusion that does not actually release destructive impulses. The assertion that power through creation is more difficult than power through destruction seems highly debatable. Indeed, at first glance it seems easier to destroy than to create. Destroying something can be done with a single blow, while creating requires a long effort. However, if we look deeper, we see that destruction is not so easy either. First, the consequences of destruction are often unpredictable and lead to chaos. It is much more difficult to manage chaos than order. Secondly, what others have created can be destroyed in a short time, but creating something strong and durable from scratch is a grueling process. Finally, power achieved only by destruction is usually short-lived. It is based only on fear and does not create anything. Power through creation, on the other hand, is more durable because it is based on faith, love, and devotion. What is life? It is the destruction of dreams by reality. Nikolai Gogol Is destruction an objective law of the universe, or merely a subjective moral category? On the one hand, it can be argued that destruction is an integral part of natural processes. Stars are born and die, species die out, all material objects are destroyed over time. This is a cosmic law, independent of our opinion. On the other hand, however, the negative moral evaluation of destruction is an exclusively human category. There is nothing objectively bad or good in the universe. There are only processes. Destruction becomes evil only in human perception. 
Perhaps there is some metaphysical balance between creation and destruction inherent in nature itself. But morality, including condemnation of destruction, seems to be subjective and peculiar only to man as a thinking being. The ancient Greek philosopher Democritus, one of the founders of atomistics, believed that man, like the whole world, consists of atoms. Consequently, in his opinion, man is part of the cosmos, subject to the same laws and principles. The Dutch rationalist of the 16th century Spinoza also saw an inseparable connection between man and nature. According to his doctrine, man and the universe are manifestations of a single substance. Man is only a modus, a partial expression of this substance. Thus, both thinkers saw the deep unity of man and the cosmos due to their common nature and subordination to universal laws. On the other hand, Descartes argued that man consists of two substances, material body and immaterial soul. In this case, the soul possesses consciousness and thinking, is the source of will and does not depend on the body. The soul is immortal, eternal and indestructible, unlike the corruptible physical body. Descartes' key argument in favor of the immortality of the soul was the existence of innate ideas in man, such as the idea of God and logical truths. In his view, they could not arise from experience and therefore indicate the timeless nature of the soul. And Immanuel Kant distinguished between phenomena subject to causality and the world of things in themselves, where freedom is possible. According to Kant, causality is the a priori form of our cognition, through which we relate phenomena to each other in time. Causality is not a property of things in themselves, but the way in which our minds order experience. Things in themselves are a noumenal reality that exists independently of our consciousness. We cannot cognize things in themselves, but only phenomena, things given to us in sensation. According to Kant, space, time and causality apply only to the world of phenomena, but not to the world of things in themselves. Thus, Kant drew a line between how the world appears to us and what it really is. When technology exceeds our understanding of how to use it, it becomes a risk. Modern science, which has discovered many physical laws, has further reinforced the idea of determinism. But there is still a debate in philosophy to this day about the compatibility of free will and the laws of nature. On the one hand, Neurophysiology argues that our behavior is determined by biochemical processes in the brain. On the other hand, quantum mechanics allows for fundamental uncertainty, leaving room for free will. In any case, even if we are constrained by the laws of nature established by the Creator, this does not negate the moral responsibility of human beings for their actions. After all, our values and ethical standards are not derived unambiguously from the laws of physics. Whether our will is truly free or illusory is a question still awaiting resolution in philosophy. But however we answer it, human life retains meaning and value either way. Reality is an illusion, though a very persistent one. Albert Einstein First of all, what do we understand by reality? There are many theories of reality in philosophy. Realists believe that there is an objective reality independent of our perception. Idealists believe that reality is constructed by our consciousness. According to social constructivism, reality is shaped by language and social institutions. Despite the differences, most philosophers agree that a healthy contact with reality is important for normal human life. As Eric Fromm pointed out, losing this connection can lead to schizophrenia and mental illness. In order not to lose touch with reality, it is important to develop critical thinking, healthy skepticism, and to verify information from different sources. It is useful to look for objective criteria to distinguish between the real and the illusory. For example, the scientific method allows us to identify objective regularities in the world. It is also important to find a balance between the inner subjective world and external reality. The philosophy of existentialism calls for valuing subjective experience, but avoiding extreme solipsism. Reality is multifaceted, and absolute truth may be unattainable. But pursuing it through self-knowledge, dialogue, and critical analysis helps us stay connected to the world around us. Monotony and lack of new experiences dull the sharpness of feelings and emotions. Neurobiology shows that the brain needs stimulation, otherwise the production of happy hormones decreases routine limits personal growth and self-actualization. 
As Eric Fromm wrote, a person needs productive activity, not just performing mechanical actions. However, modern civilization often traps us in a squirrel wheel of routine. The habit of routine can form a passive life position. A person stops appreciating and noticing joyful moments, taking everything for granted. Transhumanism is not about turning man into a robot, but about opening up new possibilities for development and improvement. Ray Kurzweil Transhumanism is a philosophical movement that aims to overcome human biological limitations through technology. The key idea is that humans are not the crown of evolution and must evolve further with the help of science and technology. This concept has deep roots in the history of philosophy. Even Plato dreamed of an ideal state ruled by philosophers, and Aristotle believed that man by nature strives for perfection. During the Age of Enlightenment, people also believed in the limitless progress of reason. Modern transhumanism relies on advances in genetics, robotics, nanotechnology, and other advanced fields. Its proponents, such as Ray Kurzweil or Yuval Noah Harari, believe that in the 21st century, humanity will overcome aging and death and improve physical and cognitive abilities. The question of the limits of interference in human nature. On the one hand, new biomedical technologies can help relieve people of suffering and disease, but on the other, completely altering human nature can have unpredictable consequences, as philosopher Francis Fukuyama pointed out in his book our post-human future. The utilitarian goal of minimizing suffering is itself highly problematic. No one would defend pain and suffering, but the fact is that everything we consider to be the highest and most admirable qualities in ourselves and others is often related to our reaction to pain, suffering, and death, overcoming them, confronting them. A person who has not faced suffering or death lacks depth. Our ability to experience these emotions is what gives us a potential connection to all other people, living and dead. Another ethical issue is equality of access to improving technologies. As British sociologist Nick Bostrom has pointed out, transhumanist modifications could increase social inequality if they are only accessible to the wealthy. This could lead to a caste-divided post-human society. Finally, will they not lead to a loss of humanity? Will the improved humans retain their morals and ethics? Won't new inequalities between old and new people emerge? According to the research of neuroscientist Sebastian Sjung, our emotions, consciousness and free will depend on the structure of the brain. A radical change in this structure could lead to a loss of what makes us human. The question of the possibility of man becoming God as science and technology develops has long interested philosophers. Indeed, if we assume that there is a certain limit of knowledge, what will happen when mankind reaches it? On the one hand, complete comprehension of the structure of the universe will give us enormous power over matter, space and time. We will be able to create new worlds, to control the fundamental forces of nature. In this sense, man will come closer to God. However, there is another point of view. Man's God realization is only an illusion because he will not be able to change the fundamental metaphysical truths of being. As Blaise Pascal wrote, man is a thinking reed and his possibilities are limited. Moreover, omniscience does not guarantee wisdom and humanity at all. The all-consuming desire for power can lead to disaster if it is not balanced by ethical principles. So perhaps man's real purpose is not to conquer the universe, but to know himself and his relationship with others. Don't you think that this is where the true greatness of man lies? Clark's novel Childhood's End explores the theme of man's ability to approach the level of God as technology advances. This work describes the humanity of the distant future, which with the help of incredibly powerful computers, created a simulation of an entire universe filled with intelligent life. People of this world have gained almost limitless power over the virtual reality created by them the ability to control physical laws and to exist forever inside the simulation after physical death. In fact, thanks to technology, the protagonists of the novel have acquired abilities that are traditionally attributed to God, power over the world, the ability to create intelligent life, to grant immortality. They have effectively become gods to the beings of their simulation. In this way, Clark explores the prospect of the deification of man as science and technology progress. We have created a new universe. Its laws are now determined by us, 
not by some blind forces of nature. We can observe any galaxy, any star, any planet as we wish. We are masters over time and space. Friedrich Nietzsche's famous quote, everything that does not kill us makes us stronger, touches on an important philosophical theme, how facing hardship and adversity can make a person stronger. Of course, Nietzsche did not mean any difficulties, but those that a person can overcome. Mortal danger or impossible trials can break a person, but moderate difficulties really harden us. Examples from history and biographies of outstanding people confirm this idea. Many reached heights in science, art, sports after facing serious obstacles, and did not give up. However, there is another side of this coin. Some psychologists believe that constant overcoming difficulties is not always good for the psyche, and sometimes leads to emotional burnout. Here the balance is important, and the ability to stop in time, so as not to harm yourself. It is also worth remembering that we cannot control all the circumstances of our lives. Sometimes a person faces such trials, which are not in his power to overcome, and then it is important not to blame yourself, but to accept the situation and seek ways to reconcile. Overall, the wisdom of this quote is that it encourages one not to give up in the face of difficulties, but to overcome them for the sake of personal growth. While doing so though, it is important to remember a reasonable measure of exertion and self-preservation. Struggle hardens and defeat teaches. Benjamin Disraeli. If you look back through the ages, man's primary task has been physical survival, getting food, defending against predators, fighting hunger, fighting disease. All of this required tremendous effort and mobilization of the self-preservation instinct. Over time, as civilization developed, these basic needs became much easier to meet. However, physical difficulties have been replaced by psychological and existential problems. Stress, depression, loneliness, loss of meaning. It is much harder to cope with these challenges based on instincts alone. A number of philosophers and psychologists believe that the satiety and security of modern life have given rise to the phenomenon of existential vacuum. The concept of existential vacuum was introduced by Austrian psychologist and psychiatrist Viktor Frankl in his book, Man in Search of Meaning. Frankl developed logotherapy, a method of psychotherapy based on a person's search for meaning in life. He believed that the main driving force in a person's life is the desire to find meaning. Observing concentration camp inmates, Frankl noted in many of them a state of inner emptiness and loss of purpose, which he called existential vacuum. This feeling occurs when a person sees no meaning in his or her existence. According to Frankl, the existential vacuum leads to apathy, depression, and personality disintegration. To fill this void, people often fall into various addictions. The concept of existential vacuum quickly gained popularity in psychology and philosophy. It reflected the spiritual crisis of society in the post-war years. Later, Frankl's ideas had a great influence on existential psychotherapy. What should a person do in such conditions? How to find the source of meaning, motivation, to overcome the challenges of mental, not physical property? Philosophy, spiritual practices, education, creativity, and communication can help. It may be worth re-evaluating what is really important in life when basic needs are met. The more comfort civilization creates for us, the more sluggish and weak we become. Scientific advances promise us comfort, longevity, material prosperity. But on the other hand, they also carry certain risks. A number of thinkers warned about the danger of human degradation in conditions of excessive comfort and consumption. Thus, Oswald Spengler wrote about the risk of objectification of culture in industrial society. And according to Eric Fromm, a person can turn into a passive consumer, losing the ability for genuine feelings and relationships. Another risk is the loss of autonomy and independence. The more a person relies on technology, the less he uses his personal potential. And this can lead to atrophy of will, intellect, and the ability to create. Technologization also poses a threat to ecology depleting the planet's resources, and the excess of gadgets and virtual space leads to the loss of real social ties between people. However, technology is just a tool, and everything depends on how exactly we use it. Freedom does not mean the existence of choice, but the absence of the need to choose.
Jean-Paul Sartre. Back in the 19th century, philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote about the disease of the possible. When too many paths open before a person, he gets lost and cannot choose any of them. Modern research confirms that excessive choice leads to stress, anxiety, and even depression. Psychologist Barry Schwartz shows in his book, The Paradox of Choice, that people are often less happy if they have to choose from 30 kinds of jam than if the choice is limited to six kinds. The reason is that analyzing so many choices is extremely difficult for our brains. We are afraid of missing out on the best option, spend too much effort comparing and end up being unsatisfied. Thus, in conditions of excessive choice, there is a kind of narrowing of freedom. A person is as if cornered by an abundance of possibilities from which he cannot choose. His freedom of choice is illusory. A possible solution is to consciously limit oneself, to narrow down the range of options to a reasonable one. For example, if you choose a restaurant, you can exclude in advance those that do not fit the cuisine or price category. This will make the choice easier and more informed. Thus, true freedom, perhaps, lies not in endless options, but in the ability to limit oneself. And then the choice will not be a burden, but a joy of realizing one's will. Man was born to create. Albert Camus. What can be higher for a human being than creativity? Creation of new values, ideas, works of art? Creativity brings us closer to harmony with the world, to understanding its structure. Destruction, on the contrary, distances us from the truth of being. Destructive actions can give only an illusion of freedom, an ephemeral feeling of permissiveness. But this is a dead-end path. Comprehending the laws of the universe through science and art, striving for harmonious creation, man finds true freedom, internal, not external. He is freed from fear and delusion, gains clarity and purpose. It is constructive activity based on an understanding of the nature of the universe that leads to true freedom, as opposed to fruitless destruction. Freedom should not be associated only with destruction and negation. It is useful to recall Eric Fromm's famous thesis. Freedom is not just liberation from fetters, but freedom for creative self-realization. Finding this positive aspect of freedom is an important task for both the individual and society. It is not enough to simply break the old, limiting frameworks that confine us. It is important to find or create forms of life that will allow us to grow and develop, to realize our talents and aspirations. Here, of course, the difficult question arises, which forms, structures, and institutions will facilitate the true unfolding of human potential, and which will limit it? There is probably no universal recipe. Each generation and society has to find its own answer in specific historical conditions. The pursuit of freedom is often associated with breaking the boundaries that limit us, be they laws, traditions, moral norms. When these frameworks become too tight, there is a desire to break them in order to spread one's wings. On the other hand, however, the complete destruction of all frameworks leads not to freedom, but to chaos and disorientation. Anarchy breeds violence, not creation. Therefore, reasonable freedom does not mean the total negation of all boundaries. True freedom, in my opinion, lies in a wise balance between structure and chaos. One must be able to both follow the necessary norms and creatively revise them. Breaking down outdated frameworks is sometimes necessary, but for the sake of creating new, better ones. The main thing is to maintain this creative, critical approach to reality. Freedom of thought is the only guarantee against stagnation in science. Charles Darwin The ability to think freely, reflect, analyze, draw conclusions, is what distinguishes us humans from the rest of the living world. Philosophers at different times have addressed the topic of freedom of thought. John Locke said in his writings that, what is called freedom consists chiefly in being free from the fetters and violence of others, and not in being the master of one's own will. Indeed, freedom of thought is first and foremost the absence of external constraints on the thinking process. When a person is free to think about anything without fear of persecution and punishment, unfortunately, true freedom of thought has not prevailed in all times and in all societies. Even today, it remains a fragile good that must be valued and protected. At the same time, freedom of thought is also a great responsibility. After all, we are free to hold any views, 
to preach any ideas, both lofty and dangerous, and here much depends on our wisdom and foresight. It is indeed a burden we carry, and a great deal depends on how wisely we use the gift of free thinking. No one has dominion over the mind of a man who has the courage to use his mind. Immanuel Kant